morning, everyone. As uh, Azad said, I'm Federica Bertoni, and I'm a, P I'm a data scientist at uh, Falk Renewables. And today's talk will be about deep learning-based predictive maintenance for improving wind turbines reliability. But before going deep into what uh, predictive maintenance is and uh, why it's worth doing predictive maintenance in the wind industry, I want to give a little bit an overview, overview of who I am. I'm an environmental engineer at uh, Politecnico di Milano with a PhD in information technology, and I'm currently a data scientist in Falk Renewables, which uh, as the name itself suggests, it's a renewable energy company based in Sesto San Giovanni here close to Milan which owns and manages different renewable energy assets and mostly uh, wind farms and solar plants. And what I do in my uh, daily work life and also what my team member do is to develop algorithms based on statistics and machine learning to uh, extract uh, insights that are valuable for the renewable energy sector. So here is what um, we will go through in this uh, 20 minutes talk, roughly. Uh, we will start from the de decarbonization of the energy sector that is undergoing in the last uh, decade. And then we will dive deep into the challenges and opportunities of digitalization of the energy sector. Then we will uh, mostly focus on the importance of predictive maintenance for uh, renewable assets and we will see a little bit of real world results of applying predictive maintenance to, uh, to real world case studies. And in the end, I will uh, broaden up a little bit the topic. So uh, we will go to predictive maintenance and beyond to see what we are uh, currently working on aside predictive maintenance uh, in my data science group in Falk Renewables, just to give uh, an idea of the potential of data science in the renewable energy industry. So to begin with, uh, in this slide, you can see um, an animation of the evolution of CO2 global emissions starting from the 1700s up to today. And what's uh, pretty striking from this image right here is that the colors become dark red, which means that obviously CO2 emissions started increasing dramatically after the industrial revolution up to today. But what are the main sectors that are responsible for these uh, global CO2 emissions? And the answer is right here in this pie plot, where you can see different colors associated to different sectors. And the predominant color here is the pink one, associated to energy-related sectors, such as energy used in the industry, energy used in buildings or transport which account for about 70% of the global CO2 emissions. And in order to decarbonize these sectors and meet the climate targets of the Paris Agreement, we need to start from the uh, sources that produce energy and try to decarbonize those sources, moving away from a carbon base to a renewable energy-based energy production. And this is what it's uh, going on during these last uh, 20 years or so, which is the de decarbonization of the energy sector. And the decarbonization of the energy sector offers some opportunities, which are the opportunity to have clean energy at lower operational costs with respect to carbon-based uh, energy production uh, technologies. But obviously nothing comes for free. And Next to uh, opportunities, we also have some challenges of this decarbonization. The first challenge is that we uh, are dealing now with non-programmable sources because we do not know obviously when wind power, for instance, or solar power will be available for production. So we have this uncertainty in the source, which is strictly linked to the second challenge that we see, which is grid management because uh, the main goal of grid managers is to keep the grid stable. But due to the fact that renewable energy sources are non-programmable, it makes the grid unstable. So we need to find the balance between uh, non-programmable energy sources on one side and stability of the, of the grid on the other. 
And in the end, we also have a, a third challenge, which is a distributed generation, because right now we are shifting away from a, a centralized generation to a, a distributed generation where smaller groups are producing energy, clean energy, and injecting it into the grid. So we are moving away from a, a traditional centralized grid to a decentralized grid to what is called a smart grid, which therefore needs to be managed and optimized. So we have decarbonization on one side and on the other side, we have uh, digitalization. Digitalization is another opportunity that the energy sector is facing in these last years, because a lot of hardwares are being installed on site at the plant level. So a large amount of data is being collected, but this large amount of data needs obviously to be stored and managed for uh, two different um, perspectives and uh, main goals. The first one is what it's called system-based operation, which could be um, similar to the point of view of the grid manager. And in this specific case, the large amount of data is needed uh, for what it's called the smart grid optimization. So the optimization of these distributed generation sources that are injecting energy into the grid. But on the other side, large amount of data, again, is needed for plant-based operation. And this is the point of view of the private producer, which is, for instance, uh, the uh, company that I'm working for, so Falk Renewables, which is producing clean energy and needs this large amount of data first to forecast the resource so that it knows how much energy it will produce in the next couple of hours and it will inject into the grid to be remunerated large amount of data to monitor plants, so uh, to know if a plant is healthy or it needs uh, some um, technical um, help. And a third thing which we need data for is the performance optimization, because obviously we always want our plant to be working at its best and at its maximum capacity. And the, the topic of my talk today, which is predictive maintenance, falls right in between plant monitoring and performance optimization. Uh, predictive maintenance is something that is uh, emerging in these last years, uh, not only for the renewable energy sector, but also for like uh, big consumers such as uh, supermarkets or um, big uh, industries that are uh, consuming a lot of energy with a lot of um, technical machines. But um, what's interesting to notice is its, uh, its application to the renewable energy sector and in particular to the uh, management of wind turbines, which is what we will uh, mostly focus on my talk today because we are currently using predictive maintenance for improving wind turbine reliability. And predictive maintenance has different goals and uh, tasks to perform. The first one is a continuous monitoring of the wind turbine's performance, just to know if the wind turbine is working fine or if we are noticing a deviations from its expected behavior, which means that we need to call the system operators of the wind turbine. We need to tell them, hey, I noticed this deviation in this specific component of your turbine. Can you go on site and check what's going wrong? So that we are able with our predictive maintenance algorithm to optimize these prompt inter interventions by the uh, system operators in order to minimize the wind turbine downtimes and in the end costs. Because if we minimize downtimes, we uh, basically are producing most of the time, which means we are selling energy, which obviously translate, translates into uh, a lot of money gained. But what are the target components to be monitored in a wind turbine? Because a wind turbine is uh, made up of different uh, technical components. So we need to focus just on the main components that might highlight that something is going wrong at the turbine level. And the answer is right here in this graph. This, uh, I like this graph pretty much because it represents the outcomes of two large surveys that have been conducted at the European level over the last uh, 13 years. And what you can see here is that on the rows, we have the different turbine components. 
And uh, on the left part of this plot, we have the red bars, which identify the uh, annual failure frequency, which is basically the number of failures per year due to a specific component of the wind turbine. And what we can see here is that the components on top are the ones that break the uh, most frequent during the year, whereas the components of the bottom are the ones that break the least. But on the other side, if we look at the right side of this plot with the blue bars here, we can see that the components on the bottom are the ones that are associated with the highest blue bars, which mean the higher number of days that the wind turbine is off due to a failure. So we have these bottom components such as the gearbox and generator that break less frequently, but once they break, they cause the wind turbine to be off for most of the time. So it's, I hope it's pretty obvious from my explanation now that the components that we should be focusing on for our predictive maintenance algorithm to be monitored are these ones. So gearbox, generator, and uh, main bedding, which are the ones that cause the longest downtime uh, to the wind turbine. So what we are basically proposing with our predictive maintenance algorithm is to monitor these three main components, so generator, gearbox, and main bearing, uh, in order to move away from the status quo of things, which is operation and maintenance activities on the wind turbine as are scheduled beforehand, and the system component is substituted only after an actual fault occurs. To a more improved uh, status quo of things, when we are able to uh, do an early detection of a potential fault that is going to occur in the next days or months. And uh, we are therefore able uh, to tell the system operator to go on site and check whether that specific component that is deviating from its expected behavior is about to break earlier. And here on this slide, you can see the methodological framework of our predictive maintenance uh, algorithm, which is basically composed of uh, four main steps. We start with the data cleaning step, which is, uh, I guess, the traditional uh, starting point for uh, every uh, project that we do as data scientists and machine learning practitioners. So we clean the data, uh, we identify spurious data, we re-estimate spurious or missing data just to have a clean data set that we can use then to build our model and do all uh, the tests that are needed. Then we go into a second step once our data set is clean, which is the feature engineering. And the feature engineering step is not uh, needed sometimes, but in our specific case, we thought uh, it was very important because uh, dealing with wind turbines, it means that we are dealing with about 40 or 50 variables that are recorded by the hardware on site, which is called SCADA. Uh, so 40 or 50 variables might not be very informative and representative of the target uh, variables and their target behavior that we want to model. So we perform this feature engineering step to um, narrow down the data set of most informative variables to be then used as predictors in our uh, predictive maintenance model, which relies on a convolutional neural network model characterized by multiple inputs and uh, multiple outputs, where the outputs are the three target components that we are monitoring in our wind turbine, uh, of which we are trying to represent the normal expected behavior. And the fourth and last step is what it's called fault detection. So we basically uh, raise an alarm when the expected behavior of our wind turbine component, which we model via convolutional neural network, starts deviating from the observed trajectory of the monitored component, which means that in reality, that component is deviating from its normal behavior, which means that something might be wrong with that specific component. So now I will show you a little bit of results of the different steps of uh, this methodological framework. Uh, but first, sorry, I will introduce you to the case study that we used to test our predictive maintenance algorithm, which is this pilot wind farm that you see represented here on the bottom of this slide, which is a wind farm located in northern Scotland with uh, 26 turbines for a nameplate capacity of uh, 65 megawatts. 
So here now we move into the results. Uh, this is uh, the results of the feature engineering step. Uh, I didn't um, put all the variables that we have recorded by our uh, SCADA uh, because they were too many and it was kind of hard to read. But what's interesting to notice from this uh, graph right here is basically we narrow down the number of most informative variables to 10, which are the ones represented by the red bars in order to use them as predictors for our three target variables, which are uh, represented again here on the top of this slide. So after this feature engineering step, we go into the uh, actual model results. Uh, in this case, I uh, put a graph for turbine 21 of our pilot wind farm over a period of uh, three years. So beginning of 2016 up to the end of 2019. What you can see here represented is the generator temperature evolving throughout this uh, three-year period. And in light blue, you uh, can see the observed generator temperature trajectory registered by the uh, SCADA, so uh, stored in our database. Whereas in darker blue, you can see the estimated temperature, which is the output of our uh, convolutional neural network model. And what's interesting to notice here is that for most of the time, the two trajectories overlap, which is what we would like to see for all the turbines, for all the wind farms that we uh, monitor, because it means that the expected behavior of our wind turbine matches the observed one. So nothing is wrong on site. We are happy. We don't have to tell the system operators to go and check. But what you can see here highlighted in red is the seven months period going from beginning of November 2017 to the beginning of May 2018. And what's going on here, you see a lot of orange and red dots, which are the alarms that are raised by our predictive maintenance algorithm, which means that the uh, predicted trajectory of the generator temperature, so its expected behavior, does not match the observed generator temperature behavior. So the uh, real generator temperature is deviating from its expected behavior, which means that it's probably overheating, which is bad. So we uh, should tell the system operator to go on site and check the generator because it's overheating and might lead to a failure of the wind turbine. And that's actually what happened. So at the beginning of May 2018, here, the generator failed and the wind turbine was off for about two weeks because the generator needed to be replaced. But what's interesting here is that our predictive maintenance algorithm raised the first alarm that something was wrong with the generator at the beginning of November, so about seven months earlier than the actual fault occurred. And this is the kind of output that we would expect and that we would like to see from a predictive maintenance model. But uh, we also put here a, a result from the same turbine, turbine 21, uh, but for a second component. So in this case, we're looking at the temperature of the bedding, which is another component close to the generator in the wind turbine. And what you can see here is that, again, the two trajectories, so the observed one and the modeled one of the bedding temperature basically overlap for the entire period except for these last uh, three months, starting September 2019. In this case, another alarm is raised by our model, meaning that the two trajectories are deviating one from each other. So we asked the system operator to go on site and check, but they told us that at the beginning of September, they updated the SCADA, which if you remember is the hardware that's um, collecting data on site, so uh, at the wind turbine level. And in updating the SCADA often means that the trajectory of the variables that are then recorded are shifted up. So our model correctly identified the deviation in the uh, behavior of the bearing temperature, but this deviation was just due to a software update. So actually nothing was wrong with the wind turbine, but uh, we should uh, have been informed that a software update was uh, done. So to recalibrate our model and not raise this kind of false alarms. So this means that uh, our machine learning model cannot work by itself, but obviously we need a strict collaboration also on the, let's say, human side of things 
So the system operators that should uh, give us this kind of feedback. So once they update the software or do maintenance on the turbines, so we can adjust our predictive maintenance model. So this is it for uh, the predictive maintenance. Uh, here is just a little bit of an overview uh, of the projects that we are currently working on uh, in my data science group in FALC. Just to give a brief uh, overview of the uh, different projects and the importance of data science and machine learning in uh, the energy sector, especially. So here you can see that we are working on production forecast for both uh, wind assets and solar assets. Uh, which is uh, needed especially by the energy management and trading team which uh, needs to trade energy uh, on the market. Then we have the uh, data cleaning uh, which we are um, also developing for solar. Then we have trading strategies so we are again working closely with the energy management and trading um, to help them let's say take a better decision using uh, machine learning algorithms in order to model the market dynamics and the dynamics of different um, components of the market. And in the end here on the bottom right, we have the uh, wind turbine degradation model that we are currently working on. So we are working on this uh, estimation of the degradation of wind uh, turbines, which is uh, I think it's pretty cool and I think it's uh, a pretty advanced technique that we are using. We just got some interesting results today. So uh, I think that's also a promising field aside from uh, predictive maintenance. And with this, I thank you. And here are my uh, references in case you're interested or want to know more, just get in touch. <laughs>